Okay, everybody, welcome to the Oxygenetic Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, precisionfuelandhydration.com. You can personalize your fueling and hydration strategy so you perform at your best with 15% off your first order of electrolytes and carbohydrate fuel with the code OA23 at precisionfuelandhydration.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm your host, Coach Rob Wilby, and I'm joined by Coach Chris Palfram. And Chris, how are you doing today? Hello, Rob. Hello, everyone. All very well. Thank you. Great to hear, mate. Every week, we bring you an episode of this podcast to help motivate and inspire you for your triathlon or any kind of ultra endurance needs, really. I'm hoping there are people out there listening to this, Chris, who are out for a, out for a run or a bike ride, and we're, we're going to help out people feel a little bit better about their training this week, I think, hopefully. Yeah, exactly. We're getting into crunch time, aren't we? So uh, this is the time to, to take stock, I think, as an athlete. It is. There's a lot of people with worried minds as race season approaches and, and big races are approaching. So hopefully this will be a reusable evergreen episode for people who are a week, two weeks, four weeks out from their first race or a big race of the season. We're going to go through some things that generally are on people's minds as athletes and then hopefully put people's minds at rest. But before we get started, if you can do two things for us, please. Number one, if you like and enjoy this episode, if you could like it and subscribe on the podcast player or on YouTube, whatever you're watching or listening on. And also, if you're looking for help and advice on your training, please get in touch. You can email us at help at oxygenetic.com or there's a link in the show notes. We love helping out endurance athletes. And if we can help you not make a mistake now, that means you have a really successful race day the expense of a few minutes to answer email. We'd love to do that for you. So there's tons of information in the show notes. You can even book a call through to me or Chris and, and book a membership call if you're interested in going through to have full coaching with us. But if not, drop us a line and we will do whatever we can to help our athletes out. So as you say, Chris, this week's episode is on not freaking out. I think that's the best way we can describe it, isn't it? I think you're right, Rob. And um I think you've probably had similar kind of feelings in the past in the past seasons as your big A race gets closer. And to be honest, it doesn't even have to be the A race that freaks you out. It's just the first race. Or maybe even it's just that big race sim weekend that you see in your training peaks and in your calendar that creates a bit of anxiety, a bit of, I don't know if I can even ride that long and run that far and swim the day before. It, it does. It does get a lot. So I think if we kind of give a few tips maybe of the anxieties that could be coming your way and maybe a few ideas of how to mitigate them, how to kind of reset and uh, yeah, set you on your way with positivity. Yeah, 100%. Now, before we jump into the, the main part of today's episode, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors, Precision Fuel and Hydration. You can go over and use their free fuel and hydration planning tool, and that will give you, just answering some questions online, a really good lead as to whether you're a very heavy or a very salty sweater. It's very personal to me because I'm an incredibly salty sweater, although I'm not a very heavy sweater. And so I, learn, I lose tons of sodium on a day, especially if it's hot, and it makes managing racing in the heat or any kind of long run or ride really, really challenging because really funky things start to happen with your, your level of body water and hydration when you lose a lot more sodium than normal people do. If you've ever had problems with cramp in races or training, if you've ever got to the end of a hot ride and seen that your outfit is caked in salt, guess what? That is the cue that you are slightly outside the norm. And whereas everyone has to take care of their appropriate hydration and electrolyte levels, it's really important if you're racing in the heat, and it's even more important if you are one of the outliers. So please go over and check them out. There's loads of free resources on there that are awesome, and I think they do the best overall package of hydration advice, electrolyte delivery, hydration products, energy products, the chews and the drink mixes that they're doing these days are fantastic as well. And you'll, you'll have seen them. I think they're really establishing themselves, Chris, as the perhaps market leader is, is the wrong phrase to use. It sounds a bit marketing, but they're sponsoring the PTO tour events. They're there amongst the biggest names and providing the products that are helping the pro athletes solve the problems that all of us athletes have when we're racing in the heat. So get on over to precisionfuelandhydration.com. Don't forget, you can even book a free one-to-one -one video consultation with the experts over there. Links in the show notes. And if you use the code OA23, the first time you buy stuff, you get 15% off your first order. All right, Chris, let's jump in. 
the first and most important one that I want to address after we've been away um, doing some training recently face to face with some of our athletes and we've got a wonderful bunch of athletes that we train with a lot of them are very dedicated very high achieving people in all manner and walks of life and one of the the character traits and personality traits of a person who is a high achiever is often the sense that they don't really belong in the in the environment that they're in that they've somehow accidentally snuck their way into this job and and so it is with triathlon as well a lot of people feel i'm an imposter here everybody else is fitter than i am everyone else deserves to be here i for some reason don't deserve to be here i'm sure i've done less training than everybody else it feels as though all my training hasn't gone well so it's the imposter syndrome that's the first thing that we want to talk to isn't it yeah and i think triathlon um in a way is the perfect breeding ground that imposter syndrome yeah and, right you know running cycling or swimming as three individual disciplines you can get your head around it and you know your strengths and weaknesses within that when it comes to triathlon inevitably we're all going to have what we believe is a weakness a lot of us it's in the water it's in the swim so when race day comes you know that you're going to be standing on the shore and you've got that oh my god i don't know if i can get around this swim or I've done all this swim training. I don't know if I'm going to be able to deliver the fitness that I believe I've got. And we've got extremely high expectations of ourselves. And, you know, a lot of the athletes that we work with have that. And that's a good thing if you can harness it in a positive way. But when it's not managed, it can do the total opposite. And suddenly people's race times that we would kind of expect on an average day, they don't hit them. And that's all to do with the mind. It's nothing to do with the winter block they've had, their FTP, their error. It's nothing to do with that, actually. It's how they approach their race day and how they prepare themselves mentally pre-race to make sure that when they're standing there, they're standing with a nice tall posture, positive. They know the processes they're about to go through. And it sounds silly. It sounds silly that we're just going to be talking about essentially nothing to do with training the physical body as an engine it's more the driver behind it the thinker behind it and everything that's going in your brain so if you get that right the likelihood is that the, the body is going to follow but yeah. you know we're all very busy and we're all looking for the highest ftp and the highest e pace run that we can do but at the end of the day we've got to look after the other elements yeah something something we see a lot when athletes get together in person is it's really common that they get together and they think that they're the one who is going to let the team down, who is going to let the group down, who is going to be slower on the uphills or isn't very good descending on the downhills on the bike or isn't a very good runner and will hold people up. And I really believe it's something that stops people from doing something that would move them on to the next level. Often the fear itself is the thing that stops somebody from going, well, I'll sign up for a training camp or a training weekend or it stops them asking a friend to go for a ride with them and conversely getting over that hump of i'm afraid to do this is the thing that is then going to move them forward and when they do get to ride or run or swim with somebody else they often realize either a it wasn't as bad as they thought it was going to be or more usually b it was actually pretty good and enjoyable and they come away with loads of stuff that's really positive I really am encouraging people to think if this is you, if you're listening and thinking, well, they're talking about these people, but I know that I'm an imposter. I know that I don't deserve to either. I know that my training hasn't been going well. It's you that we're talking to right now. It's almost certain that your own brain is sabotaging you a bit here and you are fitter than you think you are. And you're definitely more capable of doing things than you think you are. So I would just really encourage people, if you're in that mindset, reach out to somebody, whether it's a coach or whether it's someone you can go training with. Doing something is the way that you're going to get through it, I think. I don't think you can think your way out of faulty thinking. I think you have to act your way out of it and you have to go and do something physical to help fill yourself with the confidence on this level. So if that's you, I hope you're sitting there kind of nodding to yourself and then thinking, right, it, it might not sound like the solution these guys is giving is going to help, but just try it anyway. Try the solution and see if it helps. And if it doesn't, well, then we'll argue about it online. But try it first before you decide it isn't going to work for you. I've been on dozens of training camps, whether as an athlete or um, in a coaching format. And there's always that one person that basically on the first dinner is putting their hand up saying, can I apologise in advance? I'm, 
on the slowest, on the weakest, on all these kind of negative connotations. And one, I find that really endearing that they've, you know, they, they've kind of got that self-reflection. But the majority of the time, at the end of the week, it wasn't that person that was deemed the weakest link. And so if you can get over that, actually me being here and me being part of this training camp is already me being a far better version of myself if I wasn't be doing this. If I was at home thinking, ah, this was the training weekend that I could have gone on, but actually I don't deserve to be there, I'm going to slow everyone down. That's not the approach. If you're there, you deserve to be there because you've already been through that process. You're throwing yourself into a learning environment. And I think that's the key. If you're learning, you're doing the right thing. If you're going to a training camp and you're not learning and you actually feel like you you know it all and well that that's a slightly different scenario but if you're open-minded to learning from the coaches and from your peers the likelihood is after a few hours you're already a better athlete than when you turned up so yeah massively you know i'm really really for getting people into new environments new roads new stimulus different types of training learning from peers it's it's a huge breakthrough for athletes yeah and and there's always actually conversely there's always going to be somebody on one of these meetups weekends weeks that is the strongest and can possibly be feeling like they're being held up by people that they could be further on down the road or they they were wishing that they were being a bit pushed and i think the way for those athletes to flip it around is to just say i've come a long way it's not to sit there with a with almost like the arrogance of well this has been a bit of a waste of my time but it's to flip it around and say I can remember a time when I didn't feel like this. I can remember a time I went on a camp and wasn't sure of my abilities or got really hardly dealt to by the guys on the front of the pack. If you're now the, the man or the woman on the front of the pack dealing out the pain on the uphills or the downhills or wherever, take some time to reflect on that and the fact that that should be filling you with confidence that the training that you've done has moved your level of fitness onto the point where you can now have a slightly different vision of yourself. So that can be very valuable as well. Okay, second point I've got on our list here is athletes contacting, and this is especially people who are racing long distance and going up to the Ironman distance this year and saying, I'm really struggling to get my long rides done. I've done a couple of them. I'm looking at my program going forwards. I've still got six, eight weeks to race day, and I've got four or five really long rides left to do. And I'm struggling to get out of the door. I'm really struggling to force myself to go and do this long ride. And that's a really difficult email to read, isn't it? When you've got someone who is, is, is struggling to find the motivation to do the thing that's going to give them the ability to do the thing that they've said that they wanted to do a year ago, the event that they've set the stall out to do. Mm, I've, I've had a few conversations like this already this year, and I think it's very common. And to me, it's, again when it gets to long distance, it attracts a certain personality. And those people, those athletes tend to be all or nothing. And if it's all, it's brilliant. It's I'm doing a full distance. I'm going to be trying to get sub whatever that hour is, or I'm looking to, you know, run the fast 10K at the end, which is brilliant. But we know that life is very complicated and lots of different things can happen. And that winter block may have not set you up for the position that you would want to be in right now. So a lot of those athletes tend to think, well, I had X amount of weeks off training. That means my whole year is ruined. And I, you know, I, I very nearly fell into that trap myself with illness earlier this year. But actually, I think what can be really healthy as a process is for that athlete to kind of sit back and reflect on the original goal that they came up with six months ago, or whenever it was and be open-minded to kind of re-evaluating. And just because it wasn't your original goal doesn't mean that it's not a goal worth aiming for. And so I'm just gonna pick hypothetical numbers, but if you wanted to do a sub 12 Ironman, for example, at a specific event this year, and you know January the 1st, you were fully motivated, everything was going your way, but then stuff happened at home, work changed, your hours of training just haven't been where you want them to be. FTP hasn't risen for whatever reason. And all these things start to creep into your mind thinking, am I even the athlete that I want to be and that I believe that I was? The answer is yes. It's just that the scenario hasn't been exactly as, as you wanted it to. So to that kind of athlete, I would suggest 
kind of evaluating where you are with the harder metrics, so where your power is, how many long rides you've done and how they felt, has your nutrition improved on and off the bike in terms of sports nutrition and recovery, how is your sleep, how's your stress, all those things have a kind of holistic view of where you're at now. And if you come to the honest kind of realisation that a sub-12 might not be realistic this year, call it sub-13, call it sub-14, or call it, I just want to prove to myself that I can get to the start line, which is the hard part, and then once you're there, get to the finish line. And if you can just do that, even if it's one or two or three hours slower than your desired original goal, just change that goal. It doesn't matter if you've shared that with friends and family of the dream of sub-12. You just came up with it because you're comparing yourselves to others but the others aren't in the same situation as you so i'd kind of yeah i'd push athletes to self-reflect as opposed to reflect on other people's performances and other people's race results because at the end of the day we don't really care what the other people are doing so i think there's a healthy process within that of re-evaluating your goal as opposed to saying well i came up with sub 12 six months ago i i'm accountable to that now i have to do that and, you know, for some athletes, that just may not be the right um, approach at this stage. And I think some athletes can, can use that. The all or nothing personality can use that as an excuse to pull out entirely and say, well, I'm not going to get this thing I said I wanted to get. For, for a lot of age group men, the sub 10 thing is a classic number. I'm not going to get sub 10, so what's the point? I'm going to pull out and not bother doing the event. There's no point now. Ironman training is hard. Ironman is a hard event. People along the way have somehow decided that because lots of people have been sub 10, they have the right to be sub 10 as well. It is a thing that you have to work for multiple years at. And then lots and lots of things have got to go exceptionally well for you. And again, I've picked sub 10 here, but it might be sub nine for some people and sub 15 for other people. It's a hard event to do. And it's not hard just because of how the day is and how tiring it is. It's hard because of the six months, the 12 months, the 24 months leading up to it of the relentless day in, day out commitment to training. The person who's saying, I'm really struggling to get a long ride done and I'm worried now five weeks away from whatever I man have entered, I might just not bother. I would say to them, look, you've got the majority of the training done here. You're almost all the way there. You are going to be able to complete this event but it's not going to be easy. You didn't pick this because it was easy. If you wanted easy, you could have gone shopping at the Trafford Centre. You picked it because you're going to feel a sense of self-worth and self-respect at the end of this thing, more than something you'll generate in almost any other walk of life. But you'll do that because you reflect that you've done the hard things along the way that often, in the moment, you didn't really want to do. And, and I guarantee to anyone listening who's in this position, Lots and lots and lots of other people don't feel like getting on the bike to go and do the five or six hour ride at 6 a.m. on a Saturday after a long day of work. And the temptation is to think everyone else finds this easy and it's really hard for me. The reality is it's really hard for almost everybody. So you've just got to decide you're going to do it and you're going to have to go and get it done. That's the bottom line to this. Don't give yourself the out of you going to quit Hold yourself accountable for the fact you're going to do the best job of this that you can do. Get out there and apply yourself to it. Now, that's with the caveat that there's not injuries and niggles and things like this, meaning that you don't want to get out to get this done. But if it's just the case that you don't quite fancy it because it's a bit cloudy and there's a chance it might rain later on, then guess what? Get on wiggle and get yourself a rain jacket and get back on the horse because it isn't meant to be easy. The things that we're going to look back on and here's the news to other people listening. There's a finite number of these that you're going to do. And it's probably not going to be 20 or 30. It's probably going to be three. If we look at the general Ironman population, three is about the, the peak median number that, that people come up with of how many of these things people do in a lifetime. So don't think that there might be a next time. Don't think there might be a next year. Don't think that next year's training will be different because the chances are it won't be. If you feel like this now at five or six weeks out, the chances are next week you'll feel like this. Or next year you'll feel like this at five or six weeks out. Get out there and get it done. Finish this Ironman to the best of your ability and then decide if you don't want to do another one next year. That's fine. But do the best you can do 
and choose the hard path. You've already chosen it. Don't get off it now. Now that you're almost at the peak of the mountain. Some of my favorite moments in sport. Um, it's not actually the finish line. It's, it's the start line. And it's that energy of people being in that corral, especially over long distance triathlon, which is quite a unique experience. And kind of look to your left, look to your right, and you know what kind of journey that individual has been on to, to get to that start line. And it's phenomenal. You, you know, the majority have got full-time jobs, families, and they've inevitably had niggles along the way. They've had enormous amounts of doubts. Can I do this? Even the guys and girls at the front, they all have that. And yeah, for me, it was always that moment in the start corral where I just loved it. It's that energy of, wow, these people have been scattered around the world. They've had this similar vision to, to what I've got of being fit on a start line and one of the biggest events in the world in, in endurance sport. And here they are, they've done it. And they didn't want to wake up at 5 a.m. and go and ride in the rain, but, but they did. And if you're an individual that is able to put yourself through that for a very short period of time, when you look at the grand scheme of things, you are going to have that similar feeling in that start crowd. And it feels amazing. And give a little fist bump to the guy or girl to your left and right and look at them in the eyes and they, they know what you've done as well. So if you can get that special little moment, it, it's worth getting on the bike, I promise you. Yeah. Th there's more and more people these days, I think, who are getting themselves to the start line of Nine Man without having done the work along the way and are kind of fooling themselves that it'll be all right on the day. It's really important to me that we help people do the best they can in these events by saying to them, Let's not mess about here. This is a difficult thing that you've chosen. You're going to have to get the training right and get committed to it because otherwise you're going to be one of the people at the side of the road, 30 miles into Ironman Bolton, who's realized how tough it is and who's pulled out and who's having to make excuses to the, the family and friends. When often a lot of the time, the answer is to be found in the 20 weeks of training leading up to this thing. So get that done now. You've got the opportunity to get it done now. Whether you want to or not, get on the bike and get started and ride an hour away from home. You can always quit later and turn around and come back. In 95% of my experience, if you manage to ride an hour away from home, you're finishing the long ride because it feels great once you're out on the bike, even if it's tipping down. It's the not getting started part of it that's really, really difficult, I think, isn't it? You've got me all fired up, Roy. I want to go out now. Do we have to carry on? <laughs> I can see it. Let's yeah, do it. Let's go. <laughs> right. Next thing on our list. Common, common questions and worries from athletes. And again, I've had half a dozen of these this last week. I'm really worried about the water temperature in this event I'm doing this year. So as we're recording, we are beginning of the open water season in the UK. We're sort of early May. But the context is it has not been a warm sunny springtime over here the water hasn't warmed up very much at all and i can attest i was in the lakes about a week ago i went down and did my morning cold water dip in my trunks first thing in the morning and the water in derwent water was cold enough that it was probably the comparable temperature to the ice bath in my back garden it was probably i don't know 12 degrees say without a wetsuit it was cold enough i really had to give myself a talking to to stay in for my two minute cold water dip I was really questioning whether if I was going to go and do a swim in this this morning, would I be up for it? That was the context I was looking at it in. So if we're in a season like this, a year like this, where the water in your country hasn't warmed up very much yet, there are some things that you can do to help mitigate that. But being afraid of the fact it's cold and being in denial of the fact it's cold isn't one of them. We have to prepare for the fact it's going to be cold. And if you are going to race soon, here's the here's the you know, the fact it is going to be pretty cold in the water still. So what can we do to help you out deal with the water temperature? The first thing is an acceptance of the fact it's going to be cold water, most likely. It's not going to be the case if you're going to Mallorca to race, but it is going to be the case if you go into the lakes or if you go into Snowdonia, right? So one really good thing you can do is get your face used to the fact of what cold water feels like. And you can just do that in your sink, in your bathroom. Just fill your sink with cold water, Put your face down into the cold water and hold it there for 10 seconds. Stand up, dry your face off. Do the same thing again. Three times day one, four times day two, five times day three. It is going to be really unpleasant the first time that you do it. 
but you're going to get used to it and desensitized to it. And the reason I'm saying just your face is most of the rest of your body can be covered up in a triathlon. You'll get cold feet and hands, but that doesn't bother most people when you're wearing a wetsuit. You can have two swim hats on, which is usually going to take the worst of the chill off for most people in the open water. And you can even, uh, friends of mine have bought those new, um, what's the company called? De Boer wetsuits have brought out like a, base layer version yeah like a base layer thing with a built-in balaclava that's meant to be really really good at keeping the chill off so most of that part of your body can be covered by neoprene but your face isn't going to be so that's what you've got to get used to four or five days worth of getting your face used to the cold water goes a long way to kind of stopping you being afraid of it because you know what it feels like i think it's good remembering that it's cold for everyone so it's not you as the anomaly and you know everyone seems to say that i feel the cold more than everyone well uh, i got yeah. a question that we, we all we all, human? <laughs> we, we all feel the cold and it's how you prepare yourself to cope with the cold or whether you're gonna find success in the cold water or not so getting over that barrier of yeah it's cold i've signed up to this event that happens to be cold so therefore how can you prepare yourself to do that get in the cold water and yeah. do it little and often and you don't need to be doing three four k swims in the cold that's not what we're saying we're saying you need to adapt to the cold water so then when you do have to swim those long distances it's going to feel far more manageable so yeah i'd just add on top of that little and often even if you don't tick it off as a session on your training peak to your training plan if there's an opportunity to go to a local lake or open water i'd really get in there it makes such a big difference to race yeah yeah, hundred percent. And again, even if you you go with the aim of just acclimating to the water and not actually doing a session, what you'll find is there's a big difference to how the water and temperature feel after five minutes in it than there is after five seconds in it. And that's the mantra I want going through people's heads: is it will feel different in five minutes' time, because honestly, what feels unbearable after five seconds can be completely benign after five minutes worth in the water. You're going to have to fe uh, float face down. You're going to have to be brave and let the water go into your suit and cover it over the back of your head. But if you do that in the first few minutes, you'll then be able to have a relatively pleasant swim, even when it's really, really cold. So there's lots you can do, but pretending it's not going to happen. And even I can, I can tell you a story from Slate Man one year when Slate Man used to be in early May. It used to be the first weekend in May. And we lined up for Slate Man. It was dark skies. And swear to God, Chris, there was snow on the top of the mountains over the top of Linpadan still. And we got in and it was absolutely freezing. They said it was 12 degrees, but I've got my doubts, man. It was really cold. The wave in front of us went off. And most of them were doing head up breaststroke after the first hundred meters. So that bit where the cold becomes intolerable because people hadn't spent the few minutes lying face down in the water to get used to it. And it was really, really horrible and unpleasant. But when our wave went, the people who'd done that were able to swim properly and the people who hadn't, hadn't. So it's well worth making yourself do that if you possibly can and you're allowed in race morning before the race starts. Yeah, for sure. Now added onto that, point four, Another common thing athletes say, I'm really scared of open water. I'm really afraid of going out to swim in the open water. How do I get over my fear of being in the open water? Again, I think it's another one where people often say, it's different for me because I'm really afraid of open water. All, all these other triathletes over here, they're fine with the open water, but me, I'm really afraid because you don't understand that there are sea monsters underneath me and you don't understand I can see things moving in the water underneath me. And I get panic attacks and I, so the first thing we're speaking to these people is that's all people. That's how 99% of people experience the open water the first few times they get in there. And the first time they get in there every year as well. The bit of weed that you touch with your hand is almost definitely a snake or a shark or a trout, right? It's almost something that's got benevolent intent towards you. So I really think the way forward through this is to get yourself in there and practice, not to necessarily go down to your open water venue with the aim of swimming 3K, but to go down with the aim of getting in in the shallows in your wetsuit, getting used to the temperature, floating around and realizing that actually you can't sink when you're in your wetsuit. You couldn't physically swim to the bottom of the lake if you tried. So you're relatively safe at this point. So just get to grips with those thoughts that are coming up in your head. I'd remind those athletes in that position. Um, I mean, first of all, I can really understand that kind of 
Yeah. I say this with much respect, but that irrational fear, which which we've all we've all experienced. But and they're the worst we... ones. They're the worst fears. The rational fears, like we know yeah. that a 747 is not going to land on us, but the irrational ones are the ones that are going to get us. Yeah. But I just remind that athlete that there's no point you turning up to your next pool swim and swimming 130 per 100 as, as your pace and looking to improve that, looking to improve that. If come race day, you're on the side of the of the lake, absolutely petrified. And as soon as you get in, you're shivering. And that 130 pace is, is never going to be realistic. You're going to end up breaststroking and kind of hating the experience. And we don't want that. We want you to be a confident open water swimmer. Triathlon predominantly is open water. So you have to be throwing yourself into the open water and do it with a friend, do it with buddies, sign up to a local club if they're doing set open water sessions. Do whatever you can to basically feel comfortable in the most uncomfortable of scenarios. And there's no, you know, you can sit at home and think about it as much as you can, but unfortunately you need to be getting in that water. And I know it's cold, I know it's scary. I know that you don't have time to do it, but I promise you, you have to, you really have to. Yeah, 100%. Okay, next common email from athletes is, and this is an interesting one, isn't it? Dear coach, I'm not sure that the FTP recommendations you've given me for my race sim or my long rides, I'm not sure they're high enough for me. They feel, it feels really, really easy. I should, I think I'm different. I should be going harder than it, from what you're telling me. What would you say to those athletes, Chris? I'd ask them more questions. I'd, it's, it's a really tricky one because we're about to kind of give very general advice because we're talking to hundreds of athletes at one. And I know everyone's slightly different, but what I would say is that those percentage guidelines for um, sprint, Olympic, middle and long distance are there for a reason because we do have enough data and averages to know what does work well. And it's not just about what power you can ride at it's at what power you can ride at sustainably to be able to then run really well and so if you're one of those athletes thinking that oh i did my one hour and a half tt specific session at the weekend and i was at 80 percent of ftp and it felt easy i did a 15 minute brick off the end of it i felt fine the next day i was absolutely fine does that mean the next ride i can try 82 percent and the week after that 85 percent not really. What we're trying to do is get you super efficient at that 80%, if 80% is the example we're using. And little by little, there'll be increments. So it's not necessarily increasing your FTP. It's actually how efficient you are at that 80% and then how efficient you are at running 15 minutes, then 20 minutes, then half an hour, then 45 minutes at a slightly, slightly higher tempo. So it's again, it's a game of patience just because it felt easy on this one particular Sunday for a fairly short period of time doesn't mean it's going to feel necessarily easy when you get to the last half hour of that bike on race day knowing that you've got let's say a half marathon to run and I say run not walk the whole thing or walk the second half it's it's run and that's what's really difficult for athletes to get in their head because they're feeling super strong on the bike if they've had a good winter and it's tempting to play around with best bikes build other software by increasing your watts by another 10% or another 10 watts here and there, yeah, you might be able to squeeze that extra 10 watts, but at what cost? And the cost is a huge one physiologically. And unless you've got the kind of experience and data to show that you've been able to run off that kind of um, power increase before, the likelihood is that we're going to want you to stick within those things that we prescribe. And, and the other element of this as well is an easy ride is never a wasted ride for an Ironman triathlete or a 70.3 triathlete, no matter how easy you're riding, it's never junk miles. This is a phrase that's come over from, from running. There's no junk miles in riding because it's training your body to make you more efficient at using fat as a fuel. And if you're riding easy, you can predominantly or almost entirely fuel that ride by fat, which guess what means the pathways of fueling get more efficient it means your body is better and happier at using fat as a fuel if you are pushing the very top limits of a you know, a five hour ride and let's pick a really top age group man and let's say they're riding 75 76 percent of ftp over a five hour duration well they might well be able to do that in training but the chances are that as they're moving further and further away from their fat max point 
they're using more and more carbohydrate and it might feel good. It might feel fast and strong, but we don't know the effect that's going to have on the next three hours, 315, 334 hours worth of running that you've got to do next. We would ideally love you to start your marathon with all of your carbohydrate stores in your body still intact to use them for the marathon. So it isn't a question necessarily of I could go harder and it would feel like more of a workout. It's more to do with we can do tons of work on the bike and it never really feel particularly hard, but it is doing something really important to your fitness that you might not feel, which is why biking works so well for marathon runners. You know, if you go out and you do a four hour bike ride and it's really easy, most runners can't go out and do a four hour run because it would leave you completely ruined for the rest of the week. But it's four hours of aerobic development of, of developing those pathways of using fat as a fuel. So it's never wasted, even if you are training a little bit on the low side, which I, I'm almost certain nobody is. But even if you are, it's doing even better of a job that we want it to, which is to improve that aerobic pathway of, you know, using fat as a fuel. So that's a that's a really important point, I think, for people. It's not about pushing the top end. It's about it feeling relatively easy and sustainable for the vast majority of the long rides. I really like what you said there of um, it might feel okay at the time on the bike, but how do you feel three hours later? And it goes back to you, we've said it on the podcast and to many athletes before of there's no such thing as a good bike and a bad run. That bad run was due to the reason of an overly good bike, which therefore means it was a poor bike. And I really, you know, that's one of the things as a coach that it really kind of stresses me out of seeing these athletes saying I've pushed lifetime best power on that Ironman or that 70.3 and the first 10k everyone was brilliant ran perfectly to plan and for some reason don't know quite what but the wheels fell off and I had to walk and then had gut issues and then a niggle came and everything unravels and that unraveling is so common look at any Ironman and look at the last 10k everyone has got it wrong apart from the one or two people who are still running with a smile on their face still getting nutrition down with a big smile on their face and I remember seeing it for the first time when I got it wrong and people were running past me and they looked as if they were having fun they looked as if they were in control of of the pace style so they could increase the pain that they were going through but for more speed whereas I it was just being dealt to me I was just being dealt all this pain <laughs> my legs were just on just absolutely nothing my you know feeling dizzy um having pins and needles everywhere, being confused. And I was like, oh, what's happened? I, I had such a good bike and now what's, ha what's happened? Well, the reality, Chris, is that you probably were 15 watts over on the bike and now you're being dealt a, uh, some humble pie on the marathon. And it's nothing to do with my run. I was in the run shape of my life, but you have to protect your run. And the way to do that is all on the bike. So yeah, it's a, it's a great reminder of that, but it might feel okay on the bike, but that doesn't necessarily feel it's it's right and okay in three hours time on the run. Yeah, it should feel okay on the bike, especially at Ironman. It should do because we want you to be able to run a hard half marathon in half marathons time. So we want it to be, it's that old line, isn't it? About you want to run a good marathon at London and you're going to warm up by riding your bike there from Birmingham or from Bristol in the first place. Like that puts the context on what would your, what would your warm up bike ride look like? How would that feel? if you wanted to run a good marathon and there are people going, yeah, but it's different to Ironman. Well, it isn't different to mm -hmm. Ironman. Everyone's wearing expensive aero suits and pointy hats. It's still a long warm up ride to try and run your best marathon. So if you ride with that in mind, your preparation rides have got to be preparation with those in, in mind as well. Yeah. So it's the right kind of fatigue. Um, my old coach always used to say, the answer is always you rode too hard, whether <laughs> it's, I feel sick. I was too hot. I was dizzy. The answer's always you rode too hard. And and this was the days back when hardly anyone had a power meter. But as soon as people got them, the numbers were really, you know, I remember in the early days of coaching people, the, the bike split was the only thing you could go off. And you would sometimes get like lap one data and lap two data. And lap one was 2.30 and lap two was three hours. And you'd say, looks like you rode a bit hard on the first lap. No, no, no. I was going really easy. Well, how can you be 30 minutes slower in the second half? Oh, the headwind got up. It was really hard headwind in the back. Or it was, you know, I just... Just I, not my day. I couldn't <laughs> stomach the Mars bars I was taking, whatever it is. It's almost always that you rode too hard. So 
to go back to the original question of, I think I should be riding harder in training. Probably the answer is you should be practicing riding easier in training. So you're practicing for what you're going to do come race day. If mm. you want to have a really successful marathon. I've had lots of conversations with my athletes at the moment on my process as a coach. Once the athlete has raced and uploaded their data and I don't look at the narrative and I don't look at the times, I go straight to the last portion of the run. So if it's uh, 70.3, I go to the last 10K and I don't look at anything else. And that gives me enough kind of information on whether they've done well, whether they've paced it right. And I can make my own narrative even before I look at what the um, athlete has written. And it, it's amazing, Rob, you should try it. And it, it's it's crazy how much information you can get from that last 10K. Yeah. So if an athlete is able to set that 10K up all day and they get excited once they hit that 10K moment, it, I genuinely think it's a it's a life changing moment for those athletes, and they can start really racing then and, and overtaking hundreds of athletes within a very short period of time, and it feels amazing. It really does. So I kind of encourage any athlete listening to this to protect that last portion of the race if it's an Ironman, that's last half marathon or or 10k if it's if it's middle distance, and and test yourself, see if you can actually protect that last portion and make it the quickest for the whole day. It is a really hard sport to be successful at because you train to be really fit on the bike and then you race to not use that fitness. You race to conserve that fitness for the marathon later on. And so often an athlete making a year to year progression might see no difference in a bike time and might see a big increase in their run speed afterwards. But the difference is that they've ridden proportionally within their fitness, I think during that bike leg the second year and it hasn't shown as an increase in time or gone any faster but the difference is in that last 50 percent of the run and how they've managed to perform there yeah yeah i found that really interesting really good the last question that we've got here from athletes is my wetsuit feels really tight when i've tried it on in my bedroom and i'm really worried i think i need to go and buy a new wetsuit now before race day because i've tried this on and it's really hot and uncomfortable and really tight around the neck and I can't breathe and there's no way I'm going to be able to swim in this thing. Super, super common one from an athlete, isn't it? Especially when it's been bought over the post. It's come from a, an internet retailer. It's all wrapped in lovely thin tissue paper and you're worried that you might have to send it back and you don't want to get the thing, even get fingerprints on it because they've been told you can't send it back. So here's my first tip for you. Get it on. Go and stand in a cool shower with that wetsuit on. Pull the neck forwards and let some water run down the neck of it. Get it down the arm of the suit and let it drain out. Get it down the back of the suit if you can. Get that neoprene really wet and then turn the shower off. Squeegee the water down the arms, down the body, down the back, down the legs. Shuffle it around because you'll find when it's wet, you can, you can kind of move it around until all the water drains out completely. It's almost like a... It's like sticking a transfer onto a window, isn't it? It can kind of move around while it's still wet and then make the decision about how this suit feels. Don't try and do it when it's dry in the bedroom. And ideally, take it for a swim as well. Then go and take it for a swim. I guarantee 80% of the problems are cured because dry neoprene wasn't designed to be dry. It was designed to be wet to fit you properly. Yeah, to me, um, I've, I've never felt comfortable in a wetsuit unless I'm in the water. They're not designed for comfort. On, on dry land and you know it's the same with bib cycling shorts or a skin suit all these kind of high performance sportswear none of them are comfortable unless they're in the position that they were designed for or in the water or in the environment that they were designed for so yeah don't get too disheartened of thinking oh my god it's pulling my shoulders down i've got no mobility through my arms and joints but actually once you've kind of got the water in there and once you put it in the environment that it was designed for it, it could change a lot yeah yeah, hundred percent. I think that's the way to go. Make sure you go for a swim in it. And that's why I'd advise you if you possibly can, before you make a decision to buy a new wetsuit, go to a lake that's got test suits. And at the very least, even if it isn't the exact model that you want, try the size out in the brand, because often the, the sizing cuts are very, very similar. If you find a brand that works for you, the chances are that their cuts of suits are going to be very similar in all of their suits. And conversely, if one brand suit doesn't fit very well, I remember years ago having an amazing 
it was an orca suit that fit me like a glove. It was brilliant. And then I got offered a really good deal on a, a different kind of suit. And I wanted the, you know, the newer season suit. So I bought this one. I sold the old one, convinced this was going to be amazing. And it just didn't fit properly. It was cut for a broader shouldered, broader waisted kind of person. There was could feel water in the back of the back and it just didn't fit properly. And I had to just take the plunge and sell that online and then try and find an old version for sale of the suit that I'd already sold to somebody because that was the one that suited me really well. Very frustrating experience back in the day. Yeah, that's a very good kind of general rule to finish on, which is whichever garment fits you best is going to be your quickest one. And that's the same with a skin suit, triathlon suit, even helmet, shoes, all those things. Don't just go for yeah. Kip Gay's shoe because he runs up to go for the shoe that fits you best, that gives you the best ability, that looks after your Achilles, that gives you the best run gait possible. All those elements are far more important than when it's got the springiest carbon shoe in the, in the carbon spring in there. Or same with wetsuits, you know, the technology is always changing, but if it doesn't fit you like a glove, it's slowing you down. So just remember that. Don't fall into the marketing trap. You have to be in your room testing all these things. You have to be comfortable wearing it. Yeah. They'll say it's the fastest, but the question is, is it the fastest for you? It's it's why Matt Bottrell doesn't say buy this helmet. It's why he's got 10 different helmets to try on because it's the one that fits you and your body the best that's the fastest. There is no easy answer that, you know, a wind tunnel can tell you what's going to suit you the best or yeah, good. Good stuff, Chris. Well, listen, that's that's a lot of things that will be going through athletes' minds and worrying them. I hope that's provided help and a little bit of reinsurance for people who are sitting there in these positions. If you've got any questions around any of this stuff, feel free to drop us a line over to help oxygenetic.com. We're more than happy to bounce some ideas around with you and help you try and sort out your problems. But that just about brings us to the end of this week's show. So here are some discount codes and deals for you. PrecisionFuelAndHydration.com. You can use the code OA23 for 15% off your first electrolyte order. And at TeamOxygenAddict.com, I think we've got the most comprehensive endurance sports coaching program for busy age groupers at 70.3 and Ironman, at Sprint and Olympic, but at all the other things along the way as well, whether it's road cycling, gravel riding, swim run, endurance running, marathon running, ultras, whatever, you name it. We'd love to help you out because we coach the athlete, not the event. So please get in touch. You can book a call with me or Chris or the rest of the team by clicking the link in the show notes underneath here on YouTube and in the show notes if you're listening on the podcast player. It'd be great to see if you'd be a good fit for joining the team and see how we can best help you achieve your endurance goals for the coming season. All right, so links in the show notes, remember, so you don't have to remember them and write them down. And until next week, have a great, safe training and racing week. I'm Coach Rob Wilby, and he's Chris Poffman. There we go. Smooth as butter. And you've been listening to the Oxygen Addict Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>